Welcome to the latest episode of Verbatim Word, where we're looking for biblical truth in a daily context. I'm Justin Gary. In our last episode, we looked at influencers. We all have them, and we all influence other people. It was an awkward situation for Paul when he had to speak up to some of his peers. Some of the other leaders had stopped fellowshipping with the Greek believers because they were worried that what the Jewish believers might think. Peter changed his ways because of the fear of man. And Paul said that was hypocrisy, to do something out of social pressure, and more so because it painted the wrong picture of the gospel. What a treasure it is in life to have those who can speak the truth to us in love and help us live out the gospel in truth and grace. Today, Paul wants to point out to the Galatians that by following some of these false teachings, they were actually giving up some of the most precious things of the gospel, of following Jesus Christ in a relationship with the Holy Spirit. Today we'll be in Galatians chapter 3, verses 1 through 9. Have you ever felt like a fool? A fool has been duped by someone. They were not thinking clearly, and they fell into a trap. In our technology world, scammers have gotten really good at deceiving people. People give away information to scammers all the time, whether it be through a phone call or a link in an email or even in person. I knew a family once that was looking for a certain dog, a particular breed of dog that they were really hoping to have as a part of their family. And they found one online and they made all the arrangements, talking back and forth with the seller. And they actually had to fly to another state to pick up the animal. So the mother of this family, she flew to the other state, got to the airport, went to the place that they had arranged to meet, and no one showed up. They had been scammed. Now, this was a wise family, an educated family, a very discerning family. But if you have ever been scammed, you feel like such a fool when you think, why didn't I see or discern the signs? When Paul writes now in Galatians chapter 3, verse 1, he calls the Galatians fools. They have been duped. He says in verse 1, O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed among you as crucified? This teaching of the Judaizers sounded so convincing. They used much of the same vocabulary. They seemed to have many of the same virtues, a holy God, sinful man, forgiveness. But the means of a relationship was through works, through pressure, through fear, and they were falling for it. So Paul asks a series of questions in today's passage. And the question we see in verse 1 is, who has bewitched you? The word there, bewitched, has the connotation of being charmed or hypnotized, almost like someone is under a spell. I remember being a kid and we were driving cross country and we stopped at a state fair in some state in the Midwest and there was a hypnotist there on on stage. And now hypnotism, that's something I'm not super comfortable with in the spiritual realm. But I do remember watching this one gentleman who was being hypnotized and he was doing every single thing that the hypnotist was asking him to do, making a fool of himself in front of the crowd, which was enjoying the whole process of seeing this man doing such funny things. But the audience in that situation wonders how the person could make such a fool of themselves and stepping out of the picture sees it from afar. It makes no sense. That's what Paul is saying here. Who has bewitched you? Who has hypnotized you? Do you even see what it is that you're doing and the implications if you walk down this path? The word also has the connotations of a snake that charms its prey, kind of moving back and forth so that the prey gets frozen there in fear and does exactly what it needs to do, stay still so that it can be attacked. Or Medusa from Greek mythology, don't look at her or you'll turn to stone. The result of this bewitching that the Galatians had fallen for was they were not obeying the truth and they were forgetting the importance of the cross. Jesus' death is the key to the gospel. Man is sinful and there is no other way to be saved. If you remember when Jesus was in the garden the night before he was crucified, he prayed to the Father. Lord, if there is any other way, let this cup pass from me. If there's any other way to save the world from sin, don't make me go to the cross. Now, we know there's a truth in Scripture that says if we pray anything in accordance to God's will, he will answer it. So if there was another way, God would have answered that prayer. But there was no other way other than for Jesus to be the substitutionary sacrifice on the cross. If I can then take and go into the law and sacrifice an animal, 
or circumcise my flesh or hold to a particular diet or keep the Sabbath, then why would Jesus have to die? Paul says, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? This bewitching, we even see implications of it today. There are so many faiths in the world, and all of them have some kernels of truth. But those who cling to a false faith have actually been deceived. It's not true that all paths lead to God. The devil is a deceiver. He takes something that is not true and makes it look true. A belief in a false gospel will not save, and false gospels are all around us because there is a deceiver. I believe there are so many religions in the world today and so many faiths because there is a devil. He doesn't mind if people believe something, as long as they're believing something that is a counterfeit and will not save. Those false religions, they fill a need. They even appear to be valid, but they're not the real thing. Jesus said that there would be false Christs showing signs and wonders who would deceive. There will be a piety, a devotion, a sincerity, a sincerity. But does it save? This intensifies in the latter days before Christ returns. Uh, depending on, on your end times th theology, it looks like there's going to be one religion around the world. How is that possible when we see so many religions today? I wonder, and I'm beginning to wonder, if it's going to be more of a secular and humanistic type of faith that will have many of the same ele elements, some type of being born again or, or some higher revelation or knowledge to some social issue or the need to seek forgiveness or, or repentance. There will be some semblances of feeling like there's some something spiritual going on inside of the heart of man, but it won't be true religion. It'll be deception. The devil is a deceiver. Paul says, Galatians, you've been deceived. You've been bewitched. And Christ has been clearly portrayed amongst you as crucified. When he says they're clearly portrayed, it kind of gives the semblance of a billboard. Like when you're driving down the highway and you see this big advertisement that no one could miss. It comes from a word that has the, the connotation of plastering notices around town so that the entire town would know something that was about take, to take place or some announcement that needed to be made. The point that Paul's making is you can't miss it. The true gospel centers on Jesus, God in the flesh, coming to die for sinful man on the cross, the substitutionary sacrifice. So no, not all roads lead to heaven, even if they are basically the same thing from man's perspective. Paul has more questions he's going to ask the Galatians today. And the next one comes up in verse two. He thinks it might even be more important. He says, this only I want to learn from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? He begins about the Holy Spirit now. Now, this is huge in the New Testament compared to the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, God's Spirit came upon certain people at certain times for certain callings and certain needs. It wasn't available to everyone in every situation. In the Old Testament, the prophet Joel said that God would pour out his spirit on all flesh in the latter days. And on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, Peter quoted from that passage when the Holy Spirit fell upon the crowd there. God had promised the spirit beforehand. The spirit was a promise, not a reward. It's a part of the complete gospel. Were they rewarded after proving themselves worthy? Peter had stories of the time he went to Cornelius' house, the Gentiles, when the Holy Spirit fell upon them before he even finished his message. Or Peter had seen it also on the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit fell upon them when they were saved. And Paul saw that as well, that the Holy Spirit was given as a gift to those believers. The Spirit plays a key role in the true gospel. Jesus said that the Holy Spirit would be with his disciples and that the Holy Spirit would then be in his disciples. And then before he left, he said that the Holy Spirit would be upon his disciples. Those are three different prepositions there in the Greek when it's talking about the Holy Spirit. First of all, he said that the Holy Spirit would be with us. The Holy Spirit is alongside every single human being on this earth, walking alongside them, putting his arm around them to hopefully guide them and draw them onto the path that will lead to repentance and salvation and to eternal life. 
This is the primary work of the Holy Spirit in every single person in the world. The Holy Spirit is with them to convict them and bring them to true repentance and back into a relationship with God. Jesus said in John chapter 16, verse 17, And when he, the Holy Spirit, has come, he will convict the world of sin and righteousness and of judgment. Speaking of deception a few minutes ago, the devil has a counterfeit, and he is an accuser. The Holy Spirit brings people to a work of repentance versus the accuser who loves to bring people to a work of condemnation. One leads to being free of sin and draws us closer to God. One dwells on sin and leads us away from God and makes us feel wholly responsible to, for how to get out of the, con the situations that we're in because of our sin. Conviction versus condemnation. Repentance by the Holy Spirit versus accusation by the accuser. One is motivated by love to set me free into the fullness of what God has for me. The other is motivated by fear. One gives room for me to receive forgiveness. The other one pressures me into feeling like I have to do something about some mistake I've made in the past. One encourages forgiveness, forgiving even before there has been repentance from the other party. The other one demands penance and retribution. One forgives the past, the other one digs up the past. One covers a multitude of sin, the other brings up and shames over sin and digs for more and more. Make sure you can discern the voice of the Spirit versus the voice of the accuser. Rather than the natural, powerful conviction of the Holy Spirit, sometimes it's actually the accuser inciting us and it draws us away from God and puts all the emphasis on ourselves instead of trusting in the Holy Spirit and the finished work of Christ upon the cross. The next preposition then says that the Holy Spirit will be in us. After someone comes to true faith and receiving Christ, Christ's Spirit comes and lives within us. He seals us. It declares his ownership over us. It's his sanctifying work within us. It's his presence in me. You discover that there's a new contentment, a new fulfillment, a new peace within. You begin to hear his voice as he guides and directs you through life. You also have a hope within you knowing that you are his. The spirit within you crying out, Abba, Father. There's a promise that I am sealed in him for all of eternity. In the olden days, when they would send cargo on a ship, when it got on in the port of entry, they would seal it with a particular seal that would mark whose cargo that was. When it came to the other end and all the cargo was unloaded, to be able to claim that cargo, you had to prove that you had the seal that matched to show that you had ownership over that piece of cargo. The Holy Spirit comes in us when we receive us to mark us, to seal us as his, so that when we kept come into eternity, when we step into that place, he can show and prove that he has ownership over us and who we are. And the final preposition that Jesus used was in the book of Acts in chapter one. He said the Holy Spirit would come upon them. He will come upon us. The Holy Spirit then begins to work through us in the process of reaching others with the truth. There's a ministry of trying to reach this world for Christ that is done in our own strength, and it is not lasting, and there is a different fruit. I remember when I stepped onto the mission field, I was so in over my head. I had no idea what I was doing. Neither did our team. We had the Holy Spirit, we had the Bible, and we had prayer. And we cried out many times saying, God, give us what we need to be able to do what you've called us to do. If you've ever been in over your own head, Stop trying to do it in own, your, your own ability. Fess up to it that you do not have what it takes and receive a new portion of his Holy Spirit. The early church was filled with the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost, but each time they faced a new challenge, they cried out and God filled them once again. He refilled them to be able to do what it was that he was calling them to do. Jesus told his own disciples, those men who had faithfully followed him for three years, the best internship of all internships, on-the-job training, seeing as they walked through all these villages, the miracles that were being, being done, hearing the teachings that Jesus would repeat over and over again about the truths of the kingdom. And he said to them, wait, don't leave Jerusalem until you've received the promise 
that word promise there, it's like an engagement ring. When I proposed to my wife, I gave her an engagement ring. I was a poor missionary. It's not very impressive, but I gave her an engagement ring to say, you are mine. I want you. Will you please enter into this relationship with me? Will you please commit back to me? And that I would promise that we would fulfill those vows at an altar very soon before the Lord and before our closest friends and family. Jesus says, wait, I give you an engagement ring. I give you a promise, the Holy Spirit. Jesus had committed himself and said, I will come to you by the Holy Spirit before the disciples had done anything else. If Jesus has committed himself to you before the law, Paul says, if Jesus has given you his Holy Spirit before you did anything, will it add anything for you to go back to the law of works? Paul's going to ask another question again. He's going to bring up the foolish component again. He says in verse three, are you so foolish? Having begun in the spirit, are you now being made perfect by the flesh? Again, (laughs) are you so foolish? He can't help but wonder, what were you guys thinking? What are you guys thinking? If you began in the spirit, this work with Christ, this walk with Christ, are you now going to try it in your flesh? It's a step backwards. God did not call us to live the Christian life apart from his own, of his Holy Spirit. We can try it in our own flesh, our own strength, our own ability, our own resources. But to his own, he also said there, I'm not going to leave you as orphans. I will come to you. I will send the Spirit. He said that I will not leave you as orphans to grown men like Peter, men with families, men with businesses, and yet he calls them orphans. Is that a little condescending, Jesus? No, I don't think it is at all. Because these men, as grown as they were, as experienced they were, had a need to be fathered. They were orphans without him. They needed the continued care and provision and direction and correction of someone overseeing and cultivating their lives. There's a contrast, though, here to the modern thinking of fathering. We often hear about how fathers are, are really failing, how many single parent, single mother households are out there raising kids. When he says, I'm not going to leave you as orphans, though, he's speaking of a perfect father for those who were going to be adopted by him through faith. We can sometimes move into that phase of our Christian life where we say, Lord, I'll take it from here. Thanks for the help at the beginning. Thanks for the boost at the beginning. Thanks for giving me your Holy Spirit. But I think I've got it from here. It's a mistake mistake to do so. And you can only go so long before you need to cry out once again and say, Lord, I need to return back to the basics. I need once again to start again with your Holy Spirit, to be filled again with your Holy Spirit because I'm trying it on my own and it's miserable. It's tiring. It's a work of the flesh, not a work of the Spirit. It's interesting in the scriptures that the Holy Spirit is equated to torrents of living water that will come from our life. Think about that. A fresh stream, life-giving, cool, um, pure, crystal clear. Contrast that to the fluids that our bodies create on their own. Things like tears that are salty, urine that is not very clean, blood, spit. Those are the things that my life can produce on its own those unclean, tainted liquids. Compare that to the power of the Holy Spirit, a living stream that can come forth from us. That's what we truly need. And it doesn't come from the law or from earning it or from working it up. It comes from faith, from simply saying, Lord, I need more of your spirit. In verse four, Paul poses his next question. He says, have you suffered so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? Suffering is is never pleasant, but suffering in vain when it wasn't needed is something that would be even more frustrating. They had already suffered for being Christians. For the pagans in that time, you were a follower of Christ. You were no longer a polytheist. You no longer worshiped the gods or the idols. You no longer went to the pagan temples where things like temple prostitution took place. And so much of their society was ingrained in this pagan worship. Even the meat that you ate and bought at the market could have been dedicated to those pagan gods. So to step away in Christ and cut yourself off from these, those things brought some kinds of suffering, even in a social climate and social atmosphere. For the Jewish believers, they were marginalized because now they were no longer following Jehovah the way that they had always done through the law, but they were following Christ, which many of the Jews felt was not truly the Messiah. And so both the Jewish Christians and the Greek Christians often suffered. 
They lost businesses, they lost reputation, they lost relationships, some of them even physically persecuted to the point of death as persecution began to reign and rule in the church and the Roman Empire. There was a cross for following Christ. Paul says, have you suffered so many things in vain? Or was it really in vain? Sometimes it was easier to go back to the law, to show your acts before other people, to just go ahead and do the rituals, do the sacrifices, get the circumcision, and your certificate that you met man's demands would make life much easier for you because you had man's approval. Paul said, you suffered. And to stand for what's right actually may cost you social status or approval. But was it in vain? Keep your eyes on eternity. And that's something that the Holy Spirit does in us us as well. He gives us perspective of the things of eternity. He washes our eyes to see this world through a different lens. And sometimes we don't even understand how the world is thinking one way about certain things. And we as spirit-filled Christians look at it and see it in a totally different perspective. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. As he comes and he leads us, he seals us for eternity, but he also gives us that hope for eternity. He also gives us power to suffer if we need to. In Acts chapter 1, verse 8, he said, You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you to be my witnesses to the end of the earth. The word there, witnesses, is the Greek word martis, from which we get the word martyr. If you have to suffer for your faith, You do not have what it takes in your flesh to suffer for your faith. You will kowtow, you will bow down, you will give in, you will surrender. But if you have the Holy Spirit, you will have the supernatural ability to be his witness, even to the point of suffering, even to the point of death, even to the point of being hurt for what you believe. He told his own disciples, don't even worry in that hour what you're going to say when they call you to account. I will give you the words you need to say. The Holy Spirit will give us the power to be his witnesses, no matter how difficult it gets in this world. Paul goes on there in verse 5. He says, Therefore, he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you, does he do it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? He begins there in verse 5 by saying, therefore. Therefore is kind of a transition word. It's a word of causation. Whatever happened before then results in whatever happens next. So this is kind of a conclusion to his questions. It's one or the other. Is it the Spirit or is it going to be the works of faith? The Spirit is a precious gift. Does God work more because we do more? or because we believe and trust and let him do more. The spirit can't be worked up. It comes with trust and belief. As we are aware of our need of the Holy Spirit, and we invite the spirit into the situation, and we yield to the Holy Spirit, he comes in and fills that. It says, therefore, he who supplies the spirit to you and works miracles among you. You know, it was interesting during COVID-19 to watch the supply lines kind of get restricted a little bit. And you'd go into the store and it was a little scary sometimes to see certain products that were off the shelves because the supply lines had been restricted. And you're wondering, am I ever going to see that again? Will I ever be able to purchase that again? Whether it be toilet paper here in the United States or yeast over in some places in Europe or flour because people were worried they're going to have to bake their own bread um, or canned goods or ice cream for some reason in certain places was really hard to come by. When it comes to the Holy Spirit, the supply is never lacking. There is always more. There is always an abundance. God can always give us more of the Holy Spirit through faith and by his grace. These Gentile believers could do more if they were yielded to God by faith than a thousand Judaizer missionaries in their own efforts, which is exactly what they were doing in this message they were preaching. They were doing it in their own strength. The Galatians had the Holy Spirit. Pair this with what we saw a few verses ago. Have you, If you began in the Spirit, are you being made perfect in the flesh? With ministries and ministers, sometimes they begin in the Spirit, and as time goes on, they begin to seek to be perfected in the flesh, saying, God, we've got it. We'll take it from here. Thanks for giving us a little boost at the beginning when we really needed you, but we'll go ahead and go here. We've gotten a little smarter, a little wiser. We've kind of got ourselves established. We've got some structure here. We'll take it from here. When we are young in our own eyes, when we are weak, when we are inept, when we don't have the ability, we cry out to God to fill us and we cry out for God, to God for more of him. 
I think of the story in the Old Testament of Saul. Israel was not supposed to have a king. They were supposed to be a theocracy governed only by God. But because of some situations and because of their crying out, God spoke to Samuel the prophet and he anointed Saul as king of Israel. Saul needed the Holy Spirit at the beginning of his ministry. It says there in 1 Samuel, it says that when the Holy Spirit came upon him, he would be turned into a different man. And he was at first when the Holy Spirit fell upon him. He became a different man because of the Holy Spirit's presence in his life. But as it went on a little bit, it says, Samuel said, When you were little in your own eyes, were you not head of the tribes of Israel? And did not the Lord anoint you king over Israel? As Saul began to get a little comfortable in his role as king and to begin doing things on his own initiative that were not led by the Spirit, Samuel the prophet uh, uh, um, challenged him and says, you were little in your own eyes. You were the head of Israel. That's when God anointed you as king. Because when you knew you couldn't do it, then the only one who could do it was God working through you by his Holy Spirit. We see just a few chapters later that the spirit of the Lord departed from Saul. The spirit said, Saul, if you don't need me, if you don't want me, I'm going to walk out of this situation. You can go ahead and do it on your own strength. And the results were disastrous. Beware of the spirit of Saul. That spirit that would say at the very beginning, oh God, I need you. Oh God, I will obey you. Oh God, I will walk with you. And as time goes on and on, it becomes more about us. Sometimes fulfilling our own need. Sometimes so blinded by the results that we saw in the early days or desiring even greater results that we begin to forge forward on our own strength with our own plans, our own purposes, our own resources, even our own people around us that will begin to prop up around us and we no longer need the Lord. The spirit of the Lord departed from Saul. How tragic when ministries and people move away from the spirit. You may not even notice it at first. It's kind of like the inertia of the past seasons keep it moving for a while until it starts to unwind. It's like a car when it runs out of gas. It starts slowing down slowly until it's stopped. God supplies the spirit by faith. Trust God that he does great things that he can only get the glory for. Man can sometimes point to our education or our resources or experiences or our expertise to say that's the results. That's the reason why you have success. But that's not true. We can't do it without God. If it's in the flesh, there's no lasting fruit. If the fruit is from God by the Holy Spirit, then the fruit abides. In the next verses, Paul does a little bit of name dropping for these people who are reading there in Galatians. He drops the name of Abraham. Abraham was really the superhero of the faith. He was the one that you looked up to. He was there from the very, very beginning. So anytime the name Abraham was dropped in a conversation, ears would per perk up. So Paul mentions Abraham now in verses six, six through nine. He says, just as Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness, therefore know that only those who are of faith are sons of Abraham. And the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel to Abraham beforehand saying, in you all the nations shall be blessed. So then those who are of faith are blessed with believing Abraham. It's a key scripture there that he quotes from, from the book of Genesis, that Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. It was accounted to him. It was deposited into his account before he did anything, before circumcision. He wasn't circumcised yet and he was accounted righteous. Before the law, which would not be given for over 400 years, Abraham was already accounted righteous. This is key in God's covenants. When God covenants with his people, he agrees to do something. He basically lays it all out there. He draws up the whole contract and he says, hey guys, this is what I'm going to do for you. What's required of you is that you walk in it. If you want to walk in it, you can walk in it. If you choose not to walk in it, then you're outside the covenant. But this is what I have planned to do. And it's not dependent necessarily upon you and your behavior or your response. It's oftentimes a one-sided covenant, and he has never departed from his covenants. He believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. We're going to see this theme continue through this a lot, that the accounting took place before any actions, before any works. So the believers in Galatia did not need to go back to the law. 
because God had already accounted it to them when they just said yes in faith. It says there in verse 7, Therefore, know that only those who are faith are sons of Abraham. We had that song that's probably pretty famous that most of you probably know. Father Abraham had many sons. Many sons had Father Abraham. I am one of them and so are you. So let's just praise the Lord. Now, that is not just a kumbaya song or a we are the world song. Just all of us, we all are God's children, which is kind of a popular mantra. Paul's saying there in verse 7, those of faith. Therefore, know that only those who are of faith are sons of Abraham. Whoa, wait a second. Is this a diss to the Judaizers? Were they disowned because they had shifted to works? They were priding themselves that they were still following circumcision and the law and the diets, that they were the true sons of Abraham, and that these Gentile Greek believers out in all these cities were not actually true sons of Abraham until they submitted to the circumcision. Paul might be pointing out that these Judaizers have actually stopped playing on Abraham's team. That they are no longer the sons of Abraham, though they had worn that jersey for many years because they were no longer doing it by faith, that they had gone back to works. And the same thing that these Galatian believers, if they stopped doing it by faith and went back to works, may actually no longer be true sons of Abraham. Paul is pointing out that these Jews may have stopped playing on the right team. You know, our family background, our nationality, our citizenship do not qualify one person to be in the clear. You can have all the pedigrees, you can have all the outward signs, you can dress the part, you can know the lingo, and still not truly be one of God's people. Paul had known that himself as a Pharisee. Now, this Jew and Gentile division was huge. It was something that many struggled with in the early church, and it was not resolved very quickly. It went on for a long time because it had been a part of society for so long. There was a prejudice ingrained in the hearts for generations between the Jews and the Gentiles. It was systemic. And Paul had been a part of it. He had been a contributor as a Pharisee. He had been complicit to this. Paul's solution for this is in Ephesians chapter 2. In Ephesians chapter 2, verses 13 and 15, he says, But now in Christ Jesus, you who are once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself, Jesus himself, is our peace, who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of separation. In verses 17 through 19, And he, Jesus, came and preached peace to you who are far off and to those who were near. For through him, Jesus, we both have access by one spirit to the Father. Now, therefore, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. Paul realized in his own heart and experience, as well as in light of the message and actions of Jesus Christ, that only the cross could bring reconciliation and end the years of division that were so ingrained in that culture and that society. And that both were supplied entrance into the Father's presence through the glorious work of forgiveness that Jesus brought with his death and resurrection. The wall no longer existed. As long as Jesus' gospel was understood, received, believed, and lived out. What a prescription for reconciliation. Now, Paul also wants to point to some scripture to remind them that the things he's teaching are not something that he has made up. These have been written in scripture for a long time. Verse 8, And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel to Abraham beforehand, saying, In you all the nations shall be blessed. Gentiles were included in Abraham's faith and the legacy that would come. Paul indicates here that God knew beforehand that not all would relate through the law to God. The law was temporary. It was meant to point to the need for a savior. And he'll get to that in a few verses. And we'll get to that in a future podcast. But the nations were going to be blessed through Abraham's obedience. And ultimately that came through Jesus. As Abraham's descendants, Jesus came from a long line of Abraham's descendants. And he will save some from every tribe and nation and tongue. What a blessing in a nation when people turn to God. Ultimately, all nations will be blessed when Jesus comes to reign and to rule and to set up his kingdom on this earth. It is what the world is truly longing for today. 
When we cry out for justice, the only justice that's really going to satisfy us is when he is ruling and reigning on this earth. It's only found in him when he will reign, reign with, a, with a rod of iron, the true righteous king. That's what our hearts are longing for today. So Paul's conclusion then for the Galatians in this section we read today is in verse 9. So then, those who are faith are blessed with believing Abraham. Our question for us today, are you of faith? Are you blessed? The story we read, the parallel is in Genesis chapter 15. Abraham had already begun walking with God. He had left this pagan land where the Chaldeans, he had followed the Lord. He didn't make all the correct steps along the way. But in verse 15, when the covenant is finally established, it's nighttime and God brings Abraham outside and he says, look at the stars of heaven. If you can look at these, that's the number of descendants that I want to bring to you. If you'll just enter into this covenant with me by faith. And Abraham just took the first step. He believed. That's all that we see. That's all he could do. He had no resources at this point other than to simply believe the promise of God. And you know what? God fulfilled that promise, not Abraham. In fact, Abraham only had one child of promise, Isaac. And Abe gets all the credit for all the stars of heaven, for all those children that would come eventually, for all the blessings that would come. Think of the implications of Abraham simply believing in faith as he walked in an abiding relationship with the Lord. As we walk in an abiding relationship, saying yes and believing in faith to whatever God is asking us to do today. We don't have to think about the future. We don't have to worry about the resources. We don't have to think about the far reaching ends of it all. We just have to say, Lord, what is it that you're asking me to do today? And I want to walk in that in belief, by faith, trusting that you will supply everything, that you will fulfill your promise, and that you ultimately will receive the glory for what it is you are calling me to do today in life. As we walk in that abiding relationship, he has more than you can ever ask or think for your life. And Lord God, we just thank you so much for supplying all of our needs according to your glorious riches in Christ Jesus. We thank you, Lord, for the power of the Holy Spirit that comes upon us as believers. And we ask today, Lord, that where we are lacking, that you would fill us. That you'd fill us afresh, Lord, if we are leaking somewhere. Lord, that you return us to that center of faith where we're trusting in you and holding on to you and you alone, Lord, so you can do your work through us. Lord, we pray for our world today that is crying out for the revealing of Jesus Christ, that is crying out for your reign and for your rule, that is crying out for sin to finally be dealt with in the ultimate way, to put away this sinful world and to restore and make all things new. Lord, that is our cry of our hearts as your church today. We cry, Maranatha, O Lord, come. That is our desire. Lord, may your kingdom come, may your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And so today we commit ourselves to you as citizens of your kingdom by choice, by faith. And we ask that you would give us the grace to walk in obedience. Lord, we love you and we know that you first loved us. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. <music>